navigation system for emergency responders. If it doesn't have a long acronym, it can't be a government project. <laughs> and PHASER, Physiological Health Assessment System for Emergency Responders. Our presenter for Glancer is Jalal Mapar from DHS, uh, Science and Technology. Uh, I was teasing Jalal earlier. I told him that I was going to refer to him as an angel in terms of the investment angels because Jalal is from the government and he has truly been helping the fire service for the last several years. Uh, he has provided a lot of funding for, for these projects and helped move, th move these projects forward. He's also, I found, to be one of the most knowledgeable people. I, I occasionally will dig things out. I'll send Jalal a note, have you heard about this? And I'll get a, a full page back with the details of the item that I'm asking him if he's, if he's heard about. So, so far I have not been able to get ahead of him in any of those areas. The phaser presentation will be Dr. Maxine Batten from UCLA uh, College of Engineering. Uh, one of the smartest guys that I have ever run across, and, and quite modest, I might add, as he shake, shakes, his, shakes his head. Dr. Denise Smith from Skidmore College in New York. Uh, Dr. Smith probably has more experience than anyone else I'm aware of in dealing with firefighters, in looking at the effects of that heat and fire has on firefighters, looking at their physiological measurements. She also uh, works with the Illinois Fire Service Institute. All three of these presenters are extremely knowledgeable people and, and they'll be happy to answer questions at the end of the presentations today. I, I added a few questions as we're, as we're going into this. Location and tracking. Is it really possible to track and locate firefighters and structures? To what level of accuracy? To what level of reliability? And what are the resources needed to make it all work? In physiological monitoring, can physiological monitoring really be done effectively? How reliably? How are we going to use the information? Are there other benefits? Can it pre predict a cardiac event, which was the original charge from USFA in putting this project and asking DHS to move it forward, was could we predict cardiac events and pull firefighters out in order to save their lives when we look at, at the fatalities from heart attacks, the percentage of those that are affecting us, was there an effective way to do that? Uh, we'll, we'll look at those questions and we'll also take any questions uh, from, from the group at the end of the presentation. With, with that, I would like to introduce Jalal. Again, the genesis for this program, uh, we got a charge from uh, FEMA, from DHS FEMA, U.S. Fire Administration, um, to investigate the possibility of developing a piece of technology for tracking first responders, primarily firefighters to start with, as they go into a building. Um, everybody is familiar with these pictures, uh, the Worcester Fire, 9-11, um, a bunch of firefighters died, specifically for the Worcester Fire, if you guys recall, the six who perished couldn't find their way out and uh, they were about 100, 150 feet away from an exit door. And of course, there have been many other cases, uh, some of them directly, some indirectly, that have indicated that if there, there was a capability for tracking firefighters inside a building, they could have saved their lives. So everybody's familiar with this. I don't need to rehash this whole story for you. What we did was we took the charge that we had and turned it into a bunch of simple questions in order to start a program and understand what we need to do. 
fundamentally, the question is, where are they? And as Bruce mentioned himself, um, what is the solution? What does it look like? Um, is anybody working this area for the first responder community? What's been done so far? Again, as Bruce mentioned, how will it work? Uh, is it a device? Is it a gadget? Is it a cell phone? What is it? And obviously, the next question is, when will you have it so that you can use it to save lives? Um, at Science and Technology Directorate, we have a process for going at programs. And the first thing that we do is we want to make sure that we understand the requirements for developing the technology. So if you look at the left-hand side of this slide, that was the question that charged to us. That is to say, accurately locate and track firefighters, first responders, when they're inside a building. And obviously, as you know, if you're outside, you can use any of these commercial GPS devices that you have, Garmin, et cetera. That's the, that's the easy case. But when you're inside, GPS doesn't work. So you have to think about other ways of doing that. Um, early on in the program, this goes back to a few years ago, we did a workshop, uh, brought a bunch of first responders together, and we captured a lot of requirements that we translated into a series of functional specifications that are listed on the right-hand side. Now, I'm just showing you one page of the requirements document. So what are some of those requirements? I think notable among them, um, everybody was asking for uh, tracking inside a building in three dimensions. That's X, Y, and Z. And by far, the most challenging part of this is determining the altitude. That is to say, which floor are you on? Um, generally speaking, three meter accuracy translates into uh, a floor height of about 10 feet, which is the average height. Um, but many other responders were asking us to go better than that, get down to one meter. Um, some of the other ones that we are dealing with, and, it, and some of these requirements, when you compare them against the requirements that you see from the DOD, from the military side, these are very specific to you. Um, it has to be inexpensive. Uh, don't have the dollars to buy expensive stuff. It has to be automatic in the sense that if you look at your mission, you know, going in there 15, 20 minutes, you really want to turn this on and go in there. So everything has to be done automatically. Early on when we started to look at this, we also included a requirement that said no breadcrumbs. Uh, that is to say you don't want to go in there, drop a bunch of relay stations, and then wait for them to settle down and then kick your device and go in because you don't have time for that. The other thing was that as you go to the site of an incident, uh, most of the time you have no idea what's inside the building. So we said just assume that you don't have any floor maps. And of course, as I said before, no um, breadcrumbs. So during our requirements process, we quickly found out that there are no products. And uh, like I said, we captured a bunch of these requirements through the workshop process that we went through. We also talked to some of the other agencies, commercial industry, academic institutions, and so on. And uh, while everybody was conducting some research in some specific part of navigation systems, there was nothing that was concrete as an integrated system. So after a lot of work that we did early on, we developed some concept prototypes and we quickly settled on an architecture that used uh, some of these sensor parts that you see listed in here. Um, obviously, you need a GPS when you're outside to get a reference. When you go into the building, since you can't rely on the GPS, you want to rely on an IMU. These are accelerometers and gyros. And then um, for determining the height, we use an altimeter and a few other pieces in there. And obviously, if you're inside a building and the navigation system is working, calculating your location, you want to be able to take that information, send it out to a base station which is outside the building. Uh, at the same time, remember I said we were not relying on having any floor plans. We started some small programs trying to be creative and see if there are ways of developing graphical engines for developing floor maps on the fly. Um, early on, our first prototype looked like this. Um, it looks like a camelback, and you'll notice that about half the real estate in that device is taken by the battery. So quickly we learned that you have to do something about power. 
uh, also develop uh, a couple of small graphical engines that um, a user could kind of sit in there and instead of chalkboarding stuff, you would use that on a tablet and draw stuff and it would translate your drawings into a three-dimensional view like that. We also thought that what if at the end of the day, we need some kind of a breadcrumb, but something that would be easy to use and you wouldn't have to worry about it. So we developed these little breadcrumb relay stations that look about the size of a quarter and about half an inch thick. And they work on an automatic sensing mechanism that figures out if the signal is out of range, drops one of those, and then you get additional range by getting the signal out. So when we did our first prototype, the device that I showed you, we did some test and experimentation with that, and we quickly found out that we had the right requirements as far as the specifications that I mentioned to you, but um, technology was not mature enough to become a product. The systems that we tested, in addition to our own prototype, they worked some of the time, they did not work most of the time. And again, the major problem with these devices is um, something called multipath. At its simplest form, uh, if you think about, for example, what we're doing is if you want to do peer-to-peer -peer ranging or do uh, ranging as far as where you are, uh, you transmit a signal, receive it back, and then you know what the time of flight is, speed of light, and very quickly with some math behind it, you can calculate where you are. But if you're standing here and in front of you, you've got a wall with concrete, glass, steel, all kinds of material, the signal doesn't penetrate all the time, depending on the frequency that you pick. And it bounces all over the place, and all of a sudden it says your range is, uh, you're um, down like two kilometers down range. So those are some of the issues that we found. The other thing that we validated was from the user community, obviously the requirements that we had, we validated that, yeah, it has to be easy to use and it has to be automatic, no brain, and you just turn it on, forget, and go in there. And of course, we found out that cost is a major consideration. Um, system unit cost and all the parts that go in there. <clears throat> We'd also done some uh, testing at uh, Mascatatuck with the National Guard, um, which is the picture that you see there. Again, we verified that when this prototype system worked, we were getting about three to five meters of accuracy in X, Y, and Z. But like I said, this is about three years ago and uh, technology was not mature enough at the time because of multipath issues and some of the other problems that we had. So, um, some of the lessons that we learned, we took everything that we had and uh, looking at the state of technology as about two years ago, um, we put a program together and by comparing against also the international community, by way of collaborating with them and some of the other agencies and going looking at the conferences and the R&D community and so on, uh, our attitude was let's try to see if we can beg, borrow, copy, cheat, steal, whatever, any, anything that anybody has got that we can use and make our system develop and go faster. Um, we also at the same time were very mindful of the fact that we have to keep the user community involved and our philosophy was, you know, we're working for the user community. Uh, if what we develop does not meet their expectations, then they're not going to use it and there's no reason for this program to go forward. So we've had a, a lot of interaction with the user community from various organizations. So this program, which is now we're getting down to what this program is about, is called uh, Geospatial Location Accountability and Navigation System for Emergency Responders to go over to go boldly where no man has gone before. That is to say, to develop a product out of this now. Um, our procurement strategy was in 2009, we uh, put out a broad agency announcement. This is similar to an RFP request for proposal. And we selected two teams, uh, two competing technologies. And um, just to give you some numbers about how we went about this, we had um, more than 50 proposals uh, going through our white paper process. We ended up getting these two teams, one team led by Honeywell and another team led by Argonne Science and Technology, which has since now been absorbed by, um, by Boeing. 
our initial go in proposition was we were looking at a program to develop the um, prototype system that could become the foundation for a product in the first year and then go out two, three, four years after that, perfect it, and get it out there as a product. Well, little did we know. So the two competing solutions <coughs> that we selected, the Argon solution looks like a radio, but if you open it up, um, it has got all kinds of sensor components in it. So for size comparisons, um, what we pushed for was there's a little tracker that sits on your belt, and then you carry this radio with you as a prototype. Now, I'm gonna steal the thunder and uh, hope you'll ask me some questions. Our idea is not to give the users another radio. This will have an interface so that it will work with the existing radios that you have. What you see here is just a prototype. On the right hand side, this is the Honeywell solution. If you put the two solutions next to each other, no pictures, but as far as the components that go in there, the degree of commonality between the two solutions is probably in the order of 85%. That is to say, you still need a GPS chip in there for when you're outside, you still need an IMU, you still need an RF device, you need the radio, and you need your mesh network, and I the rest is what kind of games you play with the algorithms and the firmware that you have in there. What distinguishes the Honeywell solution from the Argon solution is that they use something called a Doppler velocimeter. If you've seen the, the latest new cars that have got these parking um, assist devices in them and you back up, it basically calculates a range and tells you it beeps when you get close to a car. So it's a similar device. Here's um, a jam-packed slide of information for you for the Argon solution that we picked. So the concept of operation is that, with that solution, is that everybody will have one of these trackers on them, and that tracker will talk to the existing radio. Right now we're using their radio. And then the more users you have, that is to say the more responders inside a team as they go into a, bu uh, into a building, they form an, automatically form an, a wireless mesh network and they get the signal out. When I say a signal, I mean each unit, each user will have a tracker that calculates the navigation solution on them. But the key is that you have to get that information out to the base station so an incident commander can look at that on a, on a big picture. Again, you see some of the requirements that we're seeing here. Um, the Argon solution uses um, some neat algorithms that handle multipath mitigation, that is the loss of signal, et cetera. Let's compare that against the Honeywell solution. So Argon solution was the radio and the tracker. Honeywell started out by using an ultra wideband and the concept of operation was that we would mount uh, one of these um, nodes on a fire truck so that when they go around a building, they would uh, form almost like a wireless mesh network from outside, and then each one would have a tracker, and then you would be able to um, triangulate with the units that you have, anchor nodes that you have outside. Well, this is what we picked as two competing solutions to go forward and develop some prototypes and do some testing. Now, let's talk a little bit about all right, so if we've got two solutions and they're doing very well and so on, what's the deployment option? Uh, one of the major driving factors for us has been, is, and will constantly be that these devices, this technology has to be inexpensive. So we have been looking at the cell phone companies as a business model. For example, the Verizons and Sprints and so on how when you sign up for a two-year contract, they almost give you the cell phone for free. So this is one of the options that we've been entertaining as far as the deployment, because if you look at the bill of materials for the various sensor components that I talked about, if you add it all up, you're looking at a couple thousand dollars, and we know that's DOA. So the question is, if you think about, everybody's got a cell phone or two, right? What we're pushing for is, can we follow one of these models that the cell phone companies have as an option and get our contractors, 
Honeywell or Argonne, and I'll talk about where we're headed this year, to pretty much offer that as a lease option or something along those lines with a subscription-based model that says, you know, you sign up for a two-year lease or something, and then, you know, you go on a charge, monthly charge, et cetera, or some usage fee. So that's one of the deployment options that we're looking at because we think that it will reduce the cost over um, several years. So um, we had two systems. Each one developed a prototype, and we went to NIST in December 2010, and we selected three buildings at the NIST campus. Um, one of them was almost like a residential house, two-story, a three-story, stucco, wood material. The other two were pretty difficult. They had all kinds of material in there. Um, some of the walls were even covered with um, panels, metal panels. And um, we had our NIST um, uh, team over there who helps us with the program to do an in independent analysis of the data. I think Bruce was talking about is it doable, is tracking doable, is it reliable, and so on. I think we've answered the question that it is doable. And uh, the reliability is something that we're working on right now. Just to give you an idea what the Honeywell solution looked like, you see the shoebox that this guy is carrying. Now, it's big, I know, but you have to realize that this is a prototype and everything is wired. That shoebox, I'll show you what it looks like this year and what it will look like next year. And at the same time, so we had the Honeywell team running their tests and then the Argon team running their tests with these two devices here. So uh, where we are today is that at the conclusion of our base period, because we're broke, we don't have that much money to carry two teams forward, we ended up going to one. And the best option that we could ask for, the two teams combined their resources together and they became one. So one team that is going forward right now is led by Honeywell, and it includes Argonne and TRX. Our strategy for going forward has been because of the budget cycles that we are going through, and everybody is familiar with what's happening these days, um, we have been pushed to stay away from programs that have a five-year tail, four-year tail, and plus the user community has been beating on us um, asking for a solution that they wanted to have yesterday. So we're trying to accelerate the program and try to get something out by next year. This is what the new Glancer unit looks like. It combines the best from the Argon solution and the best from the Honeywell solution, all jam-packed together in a unit that looks like this as a prototype that we plan to start building by the end of this year. Obviously, you're looking at the hardware and inside with the board that we have in there for the processor. That's where all the navigation calculations are done. So it includes a lot of algorithms that have been tested and are being perfected right now. So again, going back to Bruce's question about is it doable, I can tell you that it's doable. Is it reliable? I will tell you by November, December timeframe that it will be reliable because we're shooting for getting an um, early proto system like this out by next year. So what you see here are the various components in there. Now, when we combine the two teams together, one of the things that uh, we decided to get out was an ultra-wideband radio because it just wasn't working very well for us. And what you see in there, that picture that you see in there, is the prototype unit that we are testing, we're going to be testing in a few months. And um, the hands that you see are my hands, by the way. Um, as we go forward with this unit, and you can kind of see the relative size of this prototype unit, and again, I keep referring, emphasizing, this is a prototype unit. When we're done with it, our specification has been that we want it to be reduced to a size of two by four by six inches. What we're targeting for is stability, reliability, and making sure that it works at least 70, 80% of the time. We're looking at the form fit function, and we're going to start a very healthy test and evaluation system with a number of um, departments. And we're going to start small. Uh, right now, Honeywell is located in Minneapolis. They have a very good rela relationship with Plymouth Fire. So we've asked them to start talking to Plymouth, which they have been for the past year or so, and see if we can do some testing there. 
Um, Argonne is located in Fairfax, Virginia, and so we're looking at using their facility and perhaps maybe get into discussions with Fairfax Fire to see if we can locate some places to, there to do some testing. Obviously, we will go back to NIST where we have the three buildings, and uh, just as a matter of reference, those buildings are been, um, have been marked with data points as ground truth so we can compare the performance of our system against some ground, ground truth points. We had about 450 points marked and surveyed down to the centimeter level. Um, as far as the CONOPS, we're looking at, um, again, we, we want to go back to the use of breadcrumbs as a fallback position and ask the user community about their thoughts, feelings about using these breadcrumbs if they really don't have to do anything about them. And that is to say they're automatic. You don't have to worry about dropping them yourself. And also uh, the number of firefighters. Now, here's an interesting thing. For us, as the number goes up, the number of responders going into a building, the more we like it because our wireless mesh network works better and our accuracy goes better because we do peer-to-peer -peer ranging. So what is happening today, this year? Um, here's a highlight of some of the activities that we've done. Again, people keep asking about getting the solution done and getting it done quickly. Um, I'm here to tell you that it's not an easy problem. It's a complex problem. A lot of people are looking at various aspects of location tracking. Um, first responders are not the only ones. Uh, if you think about blue force tracking for the military, they're facing the same situation. We had our option kickoff for the combined team, that is the, the one team, in June 2011. Um, at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, this year we sponsored a workshop, and I'll give you some numbers on that in just a minute. I'm here today to brief you on where we are today, um, to stay uh, in touch with the research community. We go to these conferences to find out who's got what, if there's anything new that maybe we're not aware of and use. There's the IEEE conference coming up. Uh, most importantly, we have a critical design review on Wednesday. And once we go through that, then we will be ready basically to start cutting metal. That is to say, we've seen the design, we verified that the design is good, and we're ready to go develop these prototype units. And then November, December this year, we start to do some test and evaluation with some of the prototype units. Now, I put 2012 with the star in front of it. Uh, you might wonder why. Um, our budgets have been hammered. Our hope is that we will be okay for 2012, but it's still unknown. So we're gonna push forward and with your help, see how far we can get in 2012. Here's a quick view of how things look on a bar chart. Um, our goal is by next year to get these units out and give them out to a few fire departments, start uh, collecting data, get them to use them and see what kind of lessons learned we get back from them. Remember I talked about the uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Um, that's a workshop that uh, this year we sponsored. Um, we had about 145 attendees, 36 organizations. Uh, the who's who in indoor location tracking, most specifically for first responder community, attends that workshop. Just to give you an idea who's there, some of the logos that you see there, um, a bunch of people. We, this year we even had people from NASA. One of our keynote speakers was one of the chief technologists from NASA. Uh, Verizon, Qualcomm, MSA, um, a bit more. I just want to overwhelm you and uh, tell you that uh, we are pretty much in touch with the research and development community as well as the commercial industry because we want to know what they're doing and see what we can use. So. Um, let me conclude by giving you a couple of uh, clips of the testing that we did at our office, uh, DHS Science and Technology, which is in Washington, D.C. on Vermont Avenue. Our building is an inside building, um, on the left-hand side, an interior building. We've got uh, 11 floors in the building, and we took our prototypes there back in July, about a month and a half ago. first clip that I'm going to show you is, is um, uh, 
I just hope you'll be able to see that. Let me explain to you what you're seeing here. Um, on the right-hand side, you see a series of bars. Each one of those represents the floor height. So you'll see that floor number six is kind of shaded yellow. That's where we started from. And I know it's hard to see from the back, but you'll see a dot in there that will move up and down. One of the test cases that we ran for our leadership was to show them that what we've got actually works. Um, so the two guys started from our conference room on the sixth floor, almost like a facility like this. And they went outside and they started moving around and then they went up to the ninth floor. They took the elevator and came back. And what you'll see is you'll see the track. This is faster, 16 times faster than real life. Okay, so this was quick, and um, you'll notice that at times the shaded circle that you see around each person changes color from uh, green to yellow. That means that at times we were not able to get the information out, but obviously as soon as you get in range, it automatically picks up and collects it. As it collects the data, it does a burst of data to the, uh, to the base station that we had set up in the conference room. Um, very good question. If you bear with me for a second, let me finish and then I can answer your question. This one, um, we set up our base station in the lobby. So as you enter our building, just through the glass doors, we set up the base station there and the two guys started from the ground floor and they went up to the third floor and came back. Again, going up through the elevator. Let me show you what happens with the user interface that we have if you have more than two people. Again, just to give you an idea what our user interface looks like right now, this is not to say that this is the final solution because we need to get feedback from the user community as far as what they think about it. This is done in a, another building, same um, glass tracking unit. So this one may look busy, perhaps too busy, but then again, um, we have the ability to group people or identify people as they get maybe, for example, stranded or something like that. So this is all I have to tell you about the, the Glasser system that we're developing. Um, the Significant upcoming events for us are the November, October, November, December timeframe when we will have a few of these prototype units and we'll start testing um, outside, field testing them. Um, this concludes my presentation. Let me answer your question about the maps. Um, if you recall, at the beginning I said one of the requirements that we had was you can't assume you have the maps. So. With this one, because we were going to, into our building, what we did was we went to our building uh, facilities and said, hey, do you have any maps that we can use? 
they just gave us um, a PDF version of a map, floor map. We just put that in there in like 20 seconds. You just read the file. And we used the map just to indicate where we were for the, for the people who were seeing this. If you don't have the maps, uh, the user interface has the ability to start from the outside of the building, like a Google map that you have of the building, and then you can quickly do the contour and it builds it up for you, so at least you have some floor height. You have an idea of what building you're getting into, you can do A, B, C, D, et cetera, and then track it that way. So this concludes my presentation about the Glancer system. Thank you, Jalal. We will be bringing Jalal back up for questions, because as I was the better of the better story, but all of the other questions will be going to the program directly to you, Jalal. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, inviting us here. And it is really, truly a great privilege to be here and uh, sharing some of our experiences with you and um, getting valuable feedback from you as well. My name is Maxim Batalin. Uh, I'm from UCLA School of Engineering. And today um, I'll present um, the Physiological Health Assessment system for Emergency Responders program that is also uh, guided by our uh, program manager, DHS Joel uh, Maypar, our angel, government agent. And uh, uh, today, uh, Denise Smith from Skidmore College will also join me uh, in this presentation to discuss some of the physiological aspect of the program. Well, so um, who knows better than this audience that uh, firefighters um, have the highest occupational rate of line of duty deaths due to sudden uh, cardiac events. Um, furthermore, we are guided also by the USFA goal to decrease um, these deaths by 25% in five years and 50% in, in 10 years. And phase, uh, phases' view on uh, this primary national objective is that we need to develop a breakthrough in assuring health and safety for the emergency responder community, which really requires uh, a state-of-the-art uh, approach combining both medical services uh, and science and technological innovation. There are a number of different organizations, uh, including obviously IFF, IFC, DHS, and others who are concerned with this problem and have spent quite considerable attention and resources uh, to address this, both uh, from the point of view of uh, health and uh, fitness within the fire service. So the primary question is, well, can um, the phaser program improve upon what was uh, already done, and how can we uh, augment and further enhance uh, these capabilities? Uh, looking further into wellness and fitness I initiatives, uh, obviously you're uh, very well aware of the existing programs and uh, initiatives, and it is very important to stress that Phaser is really focusing not on replacing any of the existing programs, but rather enhancing by providing additional tools uh, for the first responders, fitness trainers, uh, and incident commanders. Um, one of the strengths of Phaser is uh, its team. And uh, uh, I'm really humbled by um, being part of this team. Uh, at UCLA, the program is uh, directed by the School of Medicine, uh, specifically Exercise Physiology uh, Laboratory, uh, which is directed by Dr. Christopher Cooper and Tom Storer, uh, both of whom have uh, a lot of experience on uh, physiology, um, uh, exercise physiology, as well as uh, Tom Storer spent quite a bit of time working specifically with the first responder community. Uh, I'm representing the UCLA College of Engineering, so I'm, I'm really the technologist in the team. We're also uh, really grateful to have Dr. Dennis Smith from Health and Exercise Sciences of the Skidmore College joining our team. As Chief Warner mentioned, Denise is one of the uh, sort of national authorities on uh, physiology of the uh, firefighters, and so we are really pleased to have her on the team. The technology part of our team is presented by the Zephyr Technology Corporation, uh, a company that has been with uh, us from the very beginning, but uh, at, the same, at the same time, we're also looking at uh, solutions 
uh, from other uh, industry collaborators, um, whom at this point in time we have quite, quite a few. Um, one other valuable partner on our team is uh, NASA. Initially, uh, we started working together with uh, Dr. David Kao from NASA Ames Research Center, and now we've extend, extended this collaboration uh, to Dr. Todd Schlegel from NASA GSC, uh, who is uh, one of the world's experts probably on automated uh, analysis of uh, uh, advanced ECG uh, systems. And I'll show you a few examples of that later on. And then finally, we are uh, indebted for the collaboration from our emergency responder partners. Um, uh, Chief Warner is uh, our advisor on all of the different endeavors that, that we take, and we closely work with our local uh, uh, department, uh, near Los Angeles, Redondo Beach Fire Department. Phaser's uh, mission, as I mentioned earlier, is really to empower emergency responders to embrace advancing technologies and medical understanding so as to increase safety and to enhance uh, wellness and fitness uh, in initiatives that are already uh, recommended or are already in place. This is really a, a restatement of what I've already mentioned, but uh, it's important to, uh, to keep, keep in mind. There are six primary specific aims for the program. First, uh, FASER team is tasked with uh, comprehensive risk factor identification and uh, analysis and prioritization. Uh, once that is done, then we are focusing on sensor selection and evaluation, which is done both uh, through the laboratory-based physiological experiments as well as through uh, field-based uh, monitoring and risk certification. Uh, all of these first four um, uh, items are really enabled by the implementation of our low-cost networked secure system for physiological monitoring that uh, I will describe uh, in detail uh, later today. And then finally, but uh, also very importantly, uh, outreach to emergency responder community to the public um, about the goals of our project, about the accomplishments of our projects uh, are also very critical. And uh, through events like these or events where we have a chance to interact with first responders uh, more closely are extremely valuable to us. So first uh, uh, specific aims is uh, the phase risk uh, 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 risk factor analysis and categorization. This slide was not really designed for uh, us to necessarily read and, dis and understand in detail, but really meant to show that our physiology team looks at a whole variety of uh, risk factors and uh, performs an analysis, uh, an end-to-end -end analysis from the risk identification to prevalence within the fire service all the way to uh, potential risk mitigation strategies and uh, ultimately changes in possible changes in concepts of uh, operation. Risk factor prioritization is another goal. In this slide, you can see just a few examples of uh, this work, and we are constantly working on uh, prioritizing risk factors that are specifically uh, most important for the first responder community and uh, developing specific suggestions for uh, risk mitigation. Uh, this work further enables us to look at the opportunities for physiological monitoring, such as baseline, during training, during emergency operations, or during the re rehabilitation, and then select those um, uh, measurements or those sensor systems that can be most applicable in each of those uh, situations. This further then enables us or guides uh, our system development uh, in the most optimal uh, fashion. Uh, we have uh, a number of different uh, collaborators, both from the government, from industry, and from academic institutions. Uh, this slide just shows uh, some uh, of the organizations that we're uh, working with, and uh, uh, please visit our website uh, where you can find ways of uh, getting in touch with us and sort of extending our reach to uh, other organizations as well. With this, I would like to invite Dr. Denise Smith to describe some of our uh, fundamental physiological monitoring work. Thank you, Maxine. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, talk to a group who is really committed to firefighter health and safety. Uh, I think Maxine's done a wonderful job talking about the scope of the program. What I want to say that I think is so exciting is the collaboration between technologists and physiologists to tackle a really difficult problem in the fire service. Now, 
there's a great deal that's known about the physiological responses to firefighting. There's more that we should know, but our current studies are not about describing physiological responses to firefighting, but rather doing physiological experiments that are the basis for the technology development, particularly the program and software development in that technology. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is to describe two types of testing that we're doing. The one type of testing is laboratory testing that provides the foundation for computer programs and the technology. And then the second one is getting the technology out to fire departments, out to firefighters to validate it in the field. And if you don't mind, I'll start with the latter. The local fire department uh, close to UCLA is Redondo Beach Fire Department. And the team has gone there to do a pilot study assessing physical fitness, identifying known risk factors, and then developing a plan to mitigate those risks. The testing that was done there utilized the Wellness Fitness Initiative and tested the parameters that have been recommended there and elsewhere and that are based on sound physiological principles. Importantly, during that pilot testing, the research team identified several abnormal cardiovascular risk factors that could be mitigated at that point. And that really is the time to be identifying cardiovascular risk factors for firefighters, is in a sound assessment before they're on the fire ground. When we take a look at the data that was generated, uh, you'll see this slide is organized with the pilot group of 48 firefighters we tested on the far right-hand side. Nine studies were collated uh, and com to compute a mean age of firefighters. So this builds on a fair bit of research in the area. We see that the firefighters that were tested at Redondo Beach were a little bit older than those that have been reported in the literature earlier. Now, encouragingly, the firefighters in this sample had a higher VO2 max. That's the overall fitness value being an average of 39.5. Now, I assume those of you in this room are really well-educated firefighters about fitness. And I want to pause here for a moment and talk about something that I think is important. The research literature suggests that a firefighter should have a VO2 max of approximately 42 mLs per kg per minute. Or you may know it as 12 mets to safely and adequately perform firefighting duties. And the NFPA 1582 standard is weighing that heavily now. So what I would submit to you is that this data reinforces what has been seen in other research projects that suggests on average, not all firefighters are as fit as they should be. On the other hand, it's somewhat encouraging these firefighters were older and more fit than earlier populations. I might also take a moment and venture into something that's even uh, more dangerous for a speaker, and that is to mention that the firefighters in our sample were also heavier than the 25 BMI that's recommended for normal weight individuals. Okay, maybe I'd get in a little more trouble. Furthermore, <laughs> many people in the fire service believe that BMI is not a good measure of body fat. And while it has problems on the individual basis, this study and others that have systematically looked at BMI and waist circumference and more criterion measures of body fat also find that the sample of firefighters is on average heavier than recommended. So the point of this is not simply to assess the fitness of firefighters. That's valuable in its own right. But what we're looking to do is to empower fitness trainers and individual firefighters so that they might use this feedback and automated feedback that's provided by the system. And Maxime will describe this in great deal uh, in a moment. But we want to provide feedback so that we can start to mitigate the problems associated with lack of fitness in the fire service. Now, one of the ways to do this is to have a better, uh, let me choose a better word, is to have a simple measure of fitness. While a VO2 max test is a criterion measure for fitness, we also understand that that's difficult for all firefighters to obtain or all fire departments to provide for all firefighters. So we have done some physiological testing in an attempt to find an easier 
to derive measure of fitness that could be used in computer or logarithms. So I want to introduce two physiological concepts to you. One is well established. It's the chronotropic index. And this has been known for decades. There's a very tight relationship, a very close relationship, with a correlation well above 0.9 or 0.95 between heart rate and oxygen consumption. If an individual does a maximum voluntary test, they, as heart rate goes up, oxygen consumption goes up because both are reflecting the work of the individual. This is a, a quick schematic that might show it. I'm sorry it doesn't build. It'd be a little bit easier. But if you look along the uh, x-axis, you see oxygen consumption, the amount of oxygen used to produce ATP for the body to support activity, plotted against heart rate. And just as I said, the black line in the center with the dots around it shows that as one goes up, the other goes up as well. Now, anything that improves performance Anything that improves performance will cause the slope of this line to decrease, whereas anything that impairs performance, and here's a little bit of bad news, the two biggest factors that impair performance would be aging and deconditioning or lack of fitness. Those two conditions would cause a steepening of this line. Okay? This is quite well established in the exercise physiology literature. Now, what we're thinking about is developing a way to look at this relationship that doesn't require the expense of equipment for measuring oxygen consumption or the time-consuming or uh, skilled technicians that are necessary. So we believe that we'd like to, well, that's a little, what we're, what we're doing is looking at the relationship between heart rate and energy expenditure as measured by a simple accelerometer. And it, sh we believe, will reflect a similar pattern. So um, Maxime mentioned that Zephyr is one of the partners. If you think of the Zephyr bioharness, many of you have seen it. In many ways, it's like a polar heart rate watch, a little more sophisticated, can measure different variables. But now you see two lines here. You see the thicker green line that is the activity being monitored. It's just activity or movement that it, the accelerometer is picking up. The lighter top line is the heart rate. So you can see both can be measured quite easily during activity, doesn't require a laboratory setup. But you also see that the relationship is not exactly linear. However, if you plot the data, and this is um, just a proof of concept, this is not um, all of the data presented, but if you plot this, act this data with activity against heart rate, what you find is that there's a strong linear relationship during the period when the firefighter is walking and a different, although strong, linear relationship during the running period. And so what this suggests is that we may be able to use this chronotropic index, modify it to become a cardiocaloric index, and use that as a measure of fitness. And we, the hope would be able to use that index of fitness in a more widespread way that was less expensive and less time consuming for the fire service. So in order to investigate that, we've undertaken a series of laboratory-based experimentations. I'm going to present one briefly that we've conducted at Skidmore College looking at the effect of PPE on this chronotropic index. So in this study, we had uh, participants do three maximal treadmill tests for us. On one day, shown on the left-hand screen, the participants came in and did a maximal treadmill test to volitional fatigue in shorts and a t-shirt. So I had them start out walking at a, a slight grade, and every minute we increased the speed and grade of the treadmill. On the far right-hand side, you'll see that I had them come in on another day and wear full PPE, so the bunker gear, uh, SCBA boots, gloves, and hood. The only piece of PPE they're not wearing is a helmet because it interfered with the face piece. And then in the center panel, you see that I also had a trial in which I asked the participants to do the same protocol while wearing a weighted vest and the SCBA. And what this allowed us to do is to sort of partition out the metabolic and cardiovascular effect of the added weight of PPE versus its encapsulating properties that increase heat strain. Uh, 
because we were in a laboratory, we could, could standardize the time of day. All participants took a telemetric pill eight hours before participating. We used the same technicians. And the weight of the PPE and the weighted vests were identical. Let me quickly orient you to this slide. Uh, this was a maximal te treadmill test to volitional fatigue. And we're showing heart rate response to that test. The control condition is shown in blue. And I think it's blue, the, the long line that goes out till about 11 minutes. In the control condition, not surprisingly, the participants could work longer, right? So this has been shown several times when people wear full PPE. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Th this is the line I'm saying is blue. In the control condition, they work the longest amount of time, but they did not achieve a higher heart rate max. The maximum heart rate is the same, but the amount of work they could do before they achieved it is greater. And again, previous research has shown that when you're working in PPE, the amount of work you can do is decreased by about 30 to 40 percent, and our results are consistent with that. The other thing I'd like to point out from this slide that I, I think is important is notice how little difference there is between the PPE and weighted vest conditions. There is a slight difference. It didn't achieve statistical significance, suggesting that during short-term activity, short-term high-intensity activity, it is the weight of the PPE that is the primary detriment, not the encapsulating properties or the heat strain. We expect that in different protocols, we might see a slightly different response there. Now looking at oxygen consumption, this chart should be read, graph should be read the same way. You see that in the control condition, they exercised for longer, but they achieved the same absolute max. So VO2 max isn't changed, but the amount of work you can do before you achieve it is greatly affected. So in conclusion, there was no difference in the chronotropic index, even when you're looking at different weights or wearing the PPE. Now I'm going to spare you going through the next study that we undertook, which was to look at the effect of core temperature or heat stress on the chronotropic index. But I want to assure you we're systematically looking at the factors that we know affect physiological responses to firefighting. So the PPE that you wear, heat stress, dehydration, we're systematically evaluating the these in the laboratory. And we've just completed a study at Skidmore, just completed data collection phase, looking at different fitness protocols. If we have a firefighter go out and do a field test of a mile run, does the chronotropic index, index that's derived from that correspond well to a maximal test in the laboratory? With that, I think I'll end my presentation and ask Maxine to tell us about the technology piece. Is included in the system with this dotted line, and what this essentially means is that uh, in phaser, we realize the sensitivity of this information within the fire service uh, uh, specifically, and therefore the system architecture, first of all, uh, addresses some of these issues uh, via state-of-the-art security and uh, protection, but also uh, each individual first responder can uh, determine on their own if they would like this part of the information to be uh, included in the system or not. Uh, upon collection and aggregation of this data, PhasingNet uh, performs analysis and then provides feedback, um, t of, uh, feedback and guidance back to the emergency responder as well as to uh, other parties uh, involved in health and wellness uh, for, for the firefighters, such as uh, paramedic teams, authorized physicians, as well as uh, peer fitness trainers. One example application of the phase net uh, system is uh, to the baseline assessment, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, in this case, the uh, representation of phase net system is shown on this slide with this um, straightforward architecture where the, um, the system that is deployed at the fire station is an access point, which is essentially a computer, can be a low-cost netbook computer, which today can be bought for uh, $150 to $100. Uh, the applications that uh, run on these uh, access points can automatically connect to the wireless or wired instruments and sensors uh, that uh, firefighters are either wearing 
while performing baseline assessment or um, uh, when the appropriate measurements are taken uh, uh, specifically at the access point. When the data is acquired, it's securely transported to the data processing to our servers, um, where then the data is uh, securely stored, archived, and then provided via uh, simple password protected feedback to the individual uh, first responders. Just to give you an example of applications of this baseline assessment uh, system, uh, this slide shows an example of the advanced ECG data acquisition, where the first responder uh, is first analyzed with the um, 12 lead ECG system that is connected to the access point at the fire station. The data collection is, uh, is taking only five to 10 minutes and we have a very easy to follow guidelines as, as to how uh, to apply the electrodes on the first responder as well as uh, collect this data. When uh, the data is collected, it is transported via uh, secure services to our uh, data archival and processing uh, system uh, where the data is archived and algorithms are applied to analyze the data automatically. In addition to this, uh, authorized personnel such as uh, our physiology team as well as um, uh, in this particular deployment, Dr. Schlegel from NASA GSC have access uh, to this data to perform uh, in in-depth analysis. I would like to also stress that the access to this data that uh, authorized personnel has does not have identification of the individuals. Each individual has uh, uh, just their own identifier and the exact name uh, and other characteristics are not revealed. Uh, then the feedback both from automated uh, analysis and analysis by the physiology teams are combined at the server and feedback is posted on uh, password protected pages at the emergency responder portal that we've created, where first responder can log in and look at the feedback uh, and the analysis of the data. The advanced ECG uh, analysis that first responders receive is uh, a document of about six to seven pages, which includes analysis uh, of the uh, conventional ECG uh, readings, as well as some of the advanced information. Some of the examples of this advanced information is just shown on this slide, where uh, for example, to each of the first responders, a plot like this will be presented, which shows statistically uh, a healthy population and the location sort of of the individual within, uh, within this, this chart. And then this chart also includes statistical properties of ECG data, uh, which are similar or um, sort of uh, relate more to uh, uh, ill population. And what we would like to see, obviously, in this case is that the score, advanced ECG score for this particular firefighter is as close to the normal population as possible and as far away from the ill population as possible as well. Uh, how else uh, this, uh, this chart can be um, useful is when strategies are applied to a particular firefighter to, to get better, either uh, fitness strategies or uh, pharmaceutical strategies, then this chart can also show if the firefighter uh, is getting better, getting closer towards this normal population, normal cloud or not. And then finally, each of the pages uh, in this advanced ECG report uh, uh, are concluded with this easy to read and easy uh, to understand uh, summary, which essentially just states that particular firefighter in this case is, uh, is com completely healthy. Another opportunity for physiological evaluation and monitoring is during on-off uh, duty, uh, duty physical fitness training. The focus uh, that FASI team is taking in this case is on automated low cost and networked fitness assessment and interventions. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, we at FASI team are really interested in uh, augmenting what is already being done in terms of health and fitness initiatives. And we would like to provide, create and provide uh, low cost, secure tools that can be used by individual first responders and peer fitness trainers in enhancing and tracking uh, fitness. Uh, as part of this, we are developing systems. Uh, one of them is NetFit Mobile, which focuses on a uh, combination of the state-of-the-art sensors. Specifically, uh, right now, the system looks at heart rate and uh, motion, and also relies on the mobile phone for data collection and real-time feedback. 
Um, this NetFit mobile uh, system is, as I mentioned, automated. It can determine workload just from the motion sensor. Uh, it can compute standard fitness measures such as, or estimate, such as VO2 max, as well as um, novel fitness measures that um, uh, Dr. Smith referred to. Uh, the system uh, also enables us to uh, monitor fitness on treadmill during uh, or during outdoor exercises, a, as I will show you in a moment. And then uh, finally, uh, the system also relies on the PhaserNet uh, architecture. Therefore, the data is also securely archived, processed, and then feedback can be delivered back to the individual firefighter. Just to show you a few examples of how uh, the system may uh, work, uh, the firefighter turns on uh, the sensor system. In this case, Zephyr Bioharness is uh, showcased. This sensor uh, is uh, using heart rate signals and motion uh, data or uh, accelerometry. Uh, this device is placed on the firefighter, uh, and then the firefighter can take their uh, mobile device, such as an Android uh, device, for example, start the NetFit mobile application, input their uh, individualized uh, data for improved automatic, automated analysis, and then initiate the usage of the system. So once this data is entered and uh, the firefighter is registered in the system, uh, there are a number of different interesting capabilities. The first capability of the system is uh, the collaboration test, where the system first tries to learn as much as possible about this individual firefighter. So in this calibration test, the uh, system on the mobile device is asking the firefighter to switch the setting on the uh, treadmill to uh, a particular speed and or grade. And uh, when this change occurs, the system records not only the heart rate that uh, that particular firefighter has at that moment in time, but also uh, different changes in uh, motion due to speed and grade changes on the treadmill. Uh, at the end, the system is capable of creating an individualized model for that individual, specifically how uh, this individual's motion data relates to changes in heart rate, and also can estimate uh, fitness uh, measures. One of these measures is shown on this plot, which is chronotropic index that Dr. Smith uh, talked about briefly today. Once the system has the model of the individual, what uh, we can do now is extend fitness monitoring uh, to the outside uh, exercising regime where the individual firefighter can walk or run outside and the application now can use the model that was created during the calibration test to track uh, the, not only the heart rate of the individual but also estimate uh, speed, distance, stride rate and then uh, ultimately compute the fitness parameters and fitness measures uh, on the fly. Switching gears a little bit, um, the phaser net system is capable to collect uh, all of this information during different points of opportunity. We believe that uh, monitoring and assessment during the rehabilitation uh, stage is another very important application of the phaser net system as we move forward. Specifically, we believe that uh, the system will be able to provide immediate access to additional physiological data to empower EMS decision making. And uh, the kind of data that can now be also made available is the fitness state of the individual, individualized medical information, and the data that was collected during the on-scene event, for example. Uh, the information that uh, is collected by the PhaserNet system is uh, archived and provided back to the first responder via the emergency responder portal that we've created, where individual firefighter can uh, log in, register, uh, this registration information is private, no one has access uh, to it. Uh, once uh, logged into the emergency responder portal, a number of different capabilities are offered to the uh, first responder. Uh, most notably, uh, access to the data and feedback, both from the fitness exercises, from the advanced ECG readings, uh, and uh, other types of feedback <coughs> provided by automated uh, algorithms as well as by the physicians uh, on the team. Uh, a couple of examples of how this feedback may look like is, is shown on this slide where there's a very simple interface that enables first responder to track their uh, fitness regimen over a period of, of a week, a month, and so forth. In this case, you can see an aerobic uh, exercise log and a resistance 
a log kind of shown side by side. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there is also access to the data that was acquired from the individual first responders and analysis of that data performed automatically or by the physiology team. Uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, we obviously uh, in phaser program we have a number of different uh, focus areas and in this particular case I just want to mention that phaser enterprise testbed is another program that we are uh, working on which focuses on development of four emergency responders uh, a first of a, of a kind infrastructure to support standardized testing and evaluation of the equipment. So imagine that uh, a fire department is, is trying to decide which uh, radio systems or sensor systems or computation systems to use for a particular task. Then uh, we're trying to develop a system that will provide a standardized approach to uh, evaluating all of these different system components uh, at the same time in an unbiased and uh, sort of fair approach. Uh, one, uh, the, the first development in this enterprise testbed is, is this mobile testbed solution which can be anchored around the uh, waistline of the uh, firefighter and uh, the system can validate various communication uh, systems attached to it, physiological environmental sensors, uh, computer platforms as well as localization systems by specifically supporting collection of the ground truth data via uh, video uh, feedback or uh, other types of monitoring. Uh, what's also interesting is that the system all of a sudden enables us to perform testing and validation of this equipment in various environmental conditions to check where, whether environmental or inter-system um, interference can be a factor. And um, uh, furthermore, the system can also be applied to characterize structures and environments of concern, such as uh, buildings, urban canyons, and uh, other structures. Uh, with this, I would like to switch to questions and discussions, and thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to remind everyone you do have evaluation suits in front of you, and uh, please fill those out. They're very important, important for the organization of the conference, and they're looking for feedback from all of these sessions. So please take time to fill those out. And we'd be happy to take any questions. A hush falls over the crowd. Yes, sir. for the program has been that uh, the interfaces for the glasses system are open, not proprietary. So if there are other manufacturers that have solutions, then they can develop their own system and it doesn't have to be the Honeywell system. And it will still work with the radios that you guys already play. Certainly let the buyer beware. Prove that it will work. Yeah, that's uh, there, there is a SCBA manufacturer that has a system that they're working on. Uh, they exhibited that system at WPI. Uh, there are a number of claims being made. Um, I've, I've been involved in looking at location tracking uh, since uh, 1999, uh, roughly. And there were some tremendous claims made and as recently as about six months ago, I sent Jalal a note based on uh, claims being made by a manufacturer here in the U.S. and asked him if he heard of him. He had indeed heard of him. Uh, he, had asked, he had sent him inquiries several times, but he had, he had never provided proof of concept. So, so certainly the buyer needs to be aware as those move forward. So what's the time frame then? Guidance, but what I can 
security with whatever you're doing with your aircraft, uh, the, the glasses system will work at the interface. So whatever aircraft you buy, uh, we are going to make sure that, it's, that we standardize on, on uh, working with the existing equipment. In other words, we're not going to just come in and say, oh, it works only with X, not Y. We don't want to disturb anything that you're doing with your ongoing activities. The other part of this is we keep talking about next year is putting out the first product line of this rotation tracking system. Again, we don't want to replace what you've got or what you're trying to buy with French, et cetera, et cetera. It will work with what you have. Joel? Um, I'm going to take a This system. Uh, the program is intended to locate you and track you. And uh, also within the program, there are so many different options that I didn't talk about. For example, if uh, you get stranded or if you're lost and if you don't move, um, it will send a signal back to the incident commander base station with your last known position so that, that you're not moving, but this is where you're located. And furthermore, with the tracks that we show, you are, I'm sorry about the screen, you probably didn't see the fish kind of moving around in the track, but it shows you the direction of the movement. So you can backtrack your location or somebody who's outside can uh, kind of draw the path that somebody has to take in to get in there. Yes, sir. Kevin. All right, so I know you have to eat the elephant one piece at a time, but is there an opportunity to, to leverage the technology that you guys are working on to fix the voice communication problem? The CCP can listen to the, the first presentation if there's a, the opportunity there. I also want to speak out against BMI discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if I understand what you're asking about voice communication. So when you speak about a mesh network, that seems to be to be a solution that might work for voice communication also. Uh, I, yes. The, the, the way we're approaching it is that because we have to deal with enough bandwidth to manage the information that we have to send out, we may be able to also help with voice communication as well. Although we're looking at, like I said before, our int intent is not to give you another radio, but just to interface with the existing radio that you already have. Uh, the current radio is no. Uh, two parts to the, to the question that you're asking. The navigation part that is on the person computes the, navi the, the location uh, at one hertz. That, that is once a second. Then uh, that information obviously is sent out at that frequency as well, uh, once a second. So it calculates and then sends it out. Can you? What, what format? Right, 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 right. Separate portable computer, um, tablet. They can use any kind of computer that they have right now. Like I said, we are keeping that interface open because, uh, you know, you talk to 10 different fire departments, they have 10 different ways of looking that they want to look at views sure. and the information that they want to have. 
So we're giving them, we're providing the, we're calculating the raw data, which is the challenging part, knowing where you are and you know, what your track looks like. How you want to display that is something that is the last 20 feet as far as the development. That is the part of the customization and integration. It is possible to lose the network, like I said, uh, but when we look at the wireless mesh network that we have, think of it as little drops and nodes. So if you've got two, three people kind of trailing off each other, they relay off each other as far as getting the signal out. And it doesn't necessarily have to have the radio there as long as you've got enough components. That's correct. That's correct. This may actually result in some significant improvements to voice communication. I think that the question that Kevin was, was asking, uh, there's going to have to be a lot of interrelationship, a lot of, a lot of work done for that to actually occur. But there is promise of resolving some of the communications problems we have within structures today based on the technology work that's being done with, within uh, this project. Uh, it's, it's a great question, um, and I, I take your central point that heat stress is a real concern for firefighters, and what they're facing on the fire ground is not the same as a laboratory. But we have, in fact, tested firefighters during live fire training and during live fire situations, and we now have a fair bit of data on that. And so I can actually take a laboratory test and have an individual work in PPE until they get their core temperature to what we typically see in a live fire situation. So we have enough data that allows us to make some of those extrapolations. And I also want to point out that in the, the one study we did, looking at the effect of body temperature, that's precisely what we did. In a laboratory, we can increase body temperature by the same amount that we have seen from previous research in live fire training. So I. What I want to say is we're using data that's in the literature as well as past studies to inform current studies that look at individual pieces. And clearly, we're mindful about the importance of heat stress. The last thing I would say is you used a, a value of 101 degrees, I believe. In fact, the core temperatures we see with firefighting range dramatically the typical what you might call room and contents where you go in and knock it down quickly, as hot as you might feel and as hot as your skin may be, there's very little increase in core body temperature. On the other hand, during prolonged exposures, whether it's auto extrication out in the sun in your PPE or prolonged firefighting, you can get much, much greater elevations. So we see a lot of variability. but. Uh, the primary thing I want to say is we're mindful of the importance of heat stress, and I think it's an area where, frankly, a lot more research needs to be done. Why don't I try to answer it, and then I'll give it to my boss. Uh, 
I think we have to acknowledge that there are several goals to this project because the problem of sudden cardiac events in the fire service is complex and it's my view that we can't get at it through only one approach. So your first question I believe was about fitness. Is this project aimed at improving the fitness of firefighters? And I would say yes, it definitely is. If we improve the fitness of firefighters, we're going to improve the safety, the health, decrease cardiovascular events, and improve performance. So that's certainly an overall goal. Whether or not it's a goal to identify a firefighter on scene in a fire so that we can, quote, pull him out before he has an event, that may be a goal, but I don't think it's a realistic goal, in my view, in the short term. Now, there may be other opinions here, and um, I, I will be speaking for myself rather than the whole team. I might say it to the fire service this way. We know there's a great deal that can be done with building inspections to keep firefighters safer. But the time to do them is probably not during a fire. I think if we're going to prevent sudden cardiac events in the fire service, there is a more opportune time to be looking for cardiovascular issues than on the scene of a fire. Now, I also believe that there's benefit to monitoring a firefighter during those operations. I think we could learn a great deal that would inform us in rehab, that would inform us in crew rotations, and that may help with cardiovascular events in some indirect way. But I am, I am not myself optimistic that the state of medical science or our understanding of human physiology lets us detect a cardiovascular event before it happens. To my knowledge, that is not where medical science is right now. So it's not a matter of finding the right technology to solve that problem. It's a matter of understanding how these events occur. Um, I, I'll give it to the person with the real answer. Let me just make one, one quick comment here. Um, we are not about predicting. It's tough. We know that. That's, that's going to take time. So you're, we're dealing with the LODD numbers that you've seen, you're familiar with. And as uh, Denise said, we're, we're trying to do something about it in the short term. So we think we can make an impact by providing, if you will, additional information about how you can improve your fitness through the exercise part of it. That's not the entire solution. That's one part that we think we can attack, attack quickly to give you something to go by. The second part is the program is not about looking at predicting something, even at monitoring something, and then saying, pull Bruce out. We're not going to tell you to pull anybody out. We just want to make sure that we capture the information and consolidate it in a set of one, two, three metrics, such as the chlorotropic index or chronotropic index or something along those lines to give an indication to an incident commander with a little bit of training as to what they're looking at based on the baseline of the individual and so on. Hey, here's what you're looking at. It's your decision. We're just giving you some information to act upon. So it's about providing actionable information. We can't make that decision for you. You have to look at that. So those are the two simple goals. Chief James, you had uh, a comment. But, um, in regards to the communications issue, uh, could not interface with the current radio uh, technology. And uh, some of that depended on uh, D-block, uh, wider brand, uh, broadband. No, what I meant was the bandwidth. We don't, we don't want to get into the bandwidth of the current radios. As far as interfacing, it's easily done. And we intend to interface with the radios. We have used the time allocated for the session. Uh, everyone here will be happy to continue to answer questions, to happy to continue to interact. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming this afternoon and uh, truly appreciate your interest. Uh, if you want to talk to any of us on an individual basis, we'd be happy to do that as well. We, we will certainly be here for a little while. And again, if, if we want to continue questions and answer, we'll do that till they throw us out of the room. <laughs>